Uh, hello, everybody. I uh, want to really thank RSD 13, particularly uh, Cheryl May, for inviting me uh, to talk on the 30th anniversary of this article I had written. Um, I had no idea that it was that old when Cheryl uh, contacted me. But uh, anyway, it's been a lot of fun going back and looking at what I had written and what threads I've taken forward since then. So um, what I want to talk about um, now, this, this notion of the uh, undisciplined um, excuse me, undisciplined look at, at systemic designing is to um, assure you that um, this is a conversation, uh, not an argumentation for something against something, which is the usual uh, strategy uh, thing that happens. Um, but to provide this or offer this as an augmentation to how people um, invest in inquiry and uh, change and in their work. So this is not meant to uh, talk people out of being engineers or uh, artists or anything like that. It's just that uh, from a system systemic perspective, I believe that this is a good augmentation to have necessary actually uh, augmentation. And um, what I wanna talk about is uh, inclusive and not exclusive. So the ideas that I'm going to be presenting are just a selected few and not at all, uh, all of them or everything that I think uh, is uh, important. And it's um, the analogy I try to look, uh, try to use that um, people don't necessarily catch all the time. Uh, but anyway, this is kind of a, a touristy tour pointing out points of interest as you know, when you get on one of these buses in a new city and it takes you around and the guide points out different points of interest that then you can go back and in, uh, look at more closely, visit uh, at your leisure. So that's what this is. This is one of those uh, touristy tours and we're not stopping and getting off the bus to, to um, uh, look at anything any closer. So, um, uh, the idea here is that you'll be presented with ideas that are complex, diverse, and determinant, all of those things. So there may be some frustration in that there isn't more detail covered. But what I wanted to do is just to make sure you knew what some of the points of interest are and that there is a lot more to them than uh, kind of just the bumper sticker in or uh, in. Uh, introduction that I'll be giving you. So the um, this river, by the way, is my backyard. Um, that what I'm doing is going to, uh, despite what Heraclitus said, I'm going to be stepping into the same river again and looking at um, uh, what I had written as I said, what I had written in this um, uh, article, the necessity of being undisciplined and out of control and uh, threads that have uh, uh, that I have worked with uh, along the way. Um, so the article was published in the Performance Improvement Quarterly. And um, the, a colleague of mine was a guest editor of a special issue and it invited me to uh, submit um, an article, and um, because of just just the title alone, he had um, come under a bit of pressure to sort of get control of what was being submitted and um, uh, something that was more acceptable. And what Gordon Rowland, who was the guest editor, said was that, uh, and this is his quote, this article was important to me. It served as an inspiration for my systemic design class, which I subsequently taught for over 20 years. In fact, the original class title was Undisciplined and Out of Control. The college curriculum committee required a change to systems thinking and design. 
when it went up for review. The journal issue overall had some impact as well, gaining a meritorious, meritorious achievement award uh, from the journal's competing organization, which I thought was quite interesting. But anyway, um, it's sort of uh, the experience that continues uh, when you're being undisciplined and out of control is there is a lot of pushback, even though there is a lot of success uh, as well. So what have I been doing? Uh, if you want to know more about some of the things I've been working on, I would invite you to look at my website, uh, www.haroldgnelson.com see some of the things over the last 30 years that surprised myself. But for instance, one of the things that um, uh, got accomplished was I wrote a book with um, a colleague, um, Eric Stolterman, called The Design Way. It's been published in, uh, in uh, two editions now, and it's in uh, three different languages. And the interesting thing, of course, from an undisciplined perspective was uh, every publisher, and there's been two of them, asked at the beginning, what is the discipline you're writing for? What's the field you're writing for? And thankfully, in each case, they accepted the notion that the book was not meant for a disciplinary field or just a domain that it was trying to reach anybody that was interested in designing at a very complex level. And it worked. And it's been a, a fairly successful book over time. So <clears throat> more recently, um, I've been working on uh, developing a new school uh, for uh, systemic design which is also an undisciplined education. And that's associated uh, with the development design of a center for systemic design, because any system, as you know, uh, can't exist outside of an environment and outside of a context. So the school has to have a context and has to have an environment. Uh, in order to be successful. So we're talking about developing an academy and an institute to uh, sort of be the supporting uh, environment context uh, for the new school. And uh, you, if you're interested in, in this, this is something that uh, we're trying to include more people in. So we'll be talking a lot about inquiry and um, there's a lot of uh, types of inquiry. And one thing is that uh, in design, in systemic design inquiry, character counts. And as you may have experienced or know, uh, you can be a good scientist and not be necessarily a nice, decent person. You can be a great artist and not be somebody that uh, anybody would want to be around for very long. And uh, that has very good uh, interpersonal a relationship or qualities. So anyway, in design, for example, the in inquiry, um, character counts. And that's just an example of how things uh, are different for uh, uh, systemic designers. Systemic designers are in relationships, they're in service relationships, um, they're in active uh, agency uh, relationships. All those make a uh, a big difference in the kind of inquiry we engage in. So inquiry in part is, uh, as it leads to systemic design, is about seeing the water. And this comes from um, this pretty well-known uh, statement um, by uh, David Foster Wallace, who gave it at a commencement. Um, they said, and I know you're never supposed to read uh, something you're, uh, when you're making a presentation, but I, I got to read this because it's just too good. There are these two young fish swimming along and they happen to meet an older fish swimming in the other way who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? The two young fish swim on for a bit 
and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the hell is water? So in systemic inquiry, what we're trying to do uh, in the undisciplined tradition is to see the water, to begin to define things like wetness. You know, what, what is it that we are immersed in? And uh, sort of leading up to this, one of the uh, books uh, that really made a difference to me uh, in my uh, graduate uh, years at uh, Berkeley was uh, West Churchman's book. West was my uh, mentor and became a close friend uh, and uh, was the head of my uh, uh, graduate uh, committee. Anyway, he wrote a book called The Design of Inquiring Systems. And I had no clue up to that point that the rules and regulations that I was given for writing things was just a design. You know, I was told about uh, how to make uh, end nodes, how to do referencing, how to do all this. In fact, I have an old uh, manual, uh, Chicago manual of style here at the desk looking at me. Um, like, why haven't you been here lately checking up on how you're supposed to do things? So West said, uh, interestingly enough, that there was different ways of um, engaging an in inquiry. And for him, he focused on inquiry for uh, discovering what was true. And he has different philosophers and different designs they use for coming up with uh, uh, what was true. And it was very liberating for me because then I could begin to think about, well, what kind of inquiry do you need for systemics? What kind of inquiry should be designed for design? which interestingly, Wes didn't uh, explore. Anyway, um, it sort of opened up a lot of things for me uh, around the notion of inquiry. And uh, one of the things uh, that uh, comes up from an undisciplined uh, perspective is that uh, the states of inquiry that we have, our own mindedness that we have is very important. And it's sort of like inquiry is both inward and outward and in between. So the inward portion of uh, uh, inquiry is like, well, what state of inquiry are you in when you're engaging with someone else or you're engaging with what you're reading or something? And um, I find in this little scale, this little schema that I've got, I find my default is usually at the affirming uh, state, which means that I'm reconfirming what I already know and what's familiar. And I have to sort of step back and readjust and decide that, well, I want to be able to hear what's new that I don't already know or what's important about the other that I'm not listening for, that sort of thing. So it's just this notion of inquiry can be uh, inward, outward, and in between, and that uh, in an undisciplined uh, approach, we have to pay attention, become minded. It's sort of like Ram Dass's teacher uh, would explain, be here now, which is probably way before your times, but uh, uh, Ram Das was kind of a, the, the one who introduced us to a lot of Eastern uh, uh, thinking uh, back in the late latter part of the last century. That sounds more than 30 years ago. Anyway, um, that's what this is all about, is like paying full attention to uh, the state that you're in, the apperception, uh, the, the means of notitia, that you're paying full attention to being here in the time, in this place with this person or these people. So taking into uh, account that, uh, in fact, you can design uh, inquiry, I've sort of took on this notion, well, becoming much more familiar with what was the designed and controlled kind of inquiry and explore more what undisciplined and out of control inquiry looks like. And um, how does it get framed so people don't re just react to it in a negative way 
immediately because they're very much in the, a control mode and in a disciplined tradition. So one of the things that uh, had influenced me was that um, well, back in 59, I think uh, C.P. Snow uh, gave a, a lecture at uh, uh, Cambridge, who's a British scientist and novelist. And um, he gave a lecture on uh, two cultures. And he said in the lecture, which later became a book, that the sciences and the humanities and arts were two cultures of inquiry. And they were so different from one another um, that they would never be able to talk to each other, to communicate with each other. So this has caused a lot of argumentation since then uh, amongst people about whether this is true or not, or how you uh, bring the two together, or how different they are. But anyway, um, people are still arguing uh, the point. And I know, I don't think I was the first one that did this, but I, I did uh, sort of come to the realization that uh, design could be considered as a third culture of inquiry. And that it has its own postulates, it has its, its own assertions, its own beliefs. And they do overlap with science or with the humanities and art. They, they do include some of that. It's design is aesthetic, it's rational, uh, but it has its own uh, underpinnings as well. And it... Uh, does not depend on the sciences or the humanities uh, for framing how it uh, uh, engages in inquiry and uh, makes meaning and uh, uh, can come to conclusions. It, it's its own form of uh, inquiry. It's its own culture. So normative inquiry, uh, I find, is that uh, this is the predominance in the West in particular, uh, is that uh, inquiry is about what is true, analysis, it's disciplined. It's about description and explanation, about prediction and control. And uh, the, uh, I guess, more of an Eastern uh, tradition is undisciplined in uh, determining what's real, what's synthesis, and uh, that everything real is not true. And uh, the um, notion that uh, these are some of the, the older ideas, I mean, especially the undisciplined uh, piece, very old forms of inquiry, uh, mean that uh, Systemic design inquiry is not brand new. It's based on some very old traditions of inquiry. Uh, things come from historical backgrounds. It's just how does um, these two traditions come together? So inquiry is uh, related to when it's not description and explanation uh, is related to action. But description and explanation cannot prescribe action. And uh, uh, but systemic design uh, does prescribe action. So description and explanation is the disciplined tradition. Uh, the systemic design inquiry is undisciplined. The uh, uh, the notion that, uh, for instance, action uh, can't be taken uh, from description and explanation. It turns out that people who describe and explain the world do take action. They do assume agency. Uh, they do tell people, uh, well, this is what I know. These are the facts. So therefore, you have to be doing this and that. And uh, of course, there's a lot of pushback uh, for that kind of relationship because people will realize well, uh, you don't really have agency, um, but you do have the knowledge, but there's all sorts of uh, workarounds in that that the, the describers and explainers use to uh, gain access to agency or to assume agency. 
So mostly we're stranded in the norm, uh, the default uh, approach of uh, assuming that uh, we are pushed into action because we identify problems and crises that we need to retreat from. So we get pushed into action because of a kind of um, this sort of negative impulse that we have, that uh, this is what the world is, this is how bad it is, um, everything is on fire, we're sort of trapped out here uh, and trying to escape. And uh, that's where people, I mean, over and over again, when I work with people, talk with people, invariably they talk about justification of action because of a problem or a crisis. But the tradition in um, design is that you're pulled into action. The design mind, it's a kind of a strange attractor for humans and even our ancestors, uh, is that we're pulled into action because there's something positive that we want to work toward that we want to advance towards. And um, that's been the case historically for even with our pre-human ancestors, creating order, organization, design, tools, um, because they wanted something different. And it wasn't that they were just escaping something or crises or uh, a problem set. They were wanting to work towards something and they were augmenting their lives with these things that they could design and, and uh, create. So when I was first getting into systems as an architect, I've been trained in, and I practice as an architect, I was trying to describe to people um, what systems was about. And in a lot of cases, it was uh, traditional designers, material designers that I was um, trying to uh, explain this to, uh, including deans of architecture schools, any number of people. And what would happen is that I would start getting into this whole shopping list of what systems, what were the different fields, the, the different domains of uh, systems. And um, somebody that I had uh, known, uh, got to know in the uh, international systems uh, science International Society for System Science, uh, Francois, uh, had written a paper and he was used this term called systemics. And it was a collective, an, an aggregation of all these different uh, kinds of fields and approaches and domains of uh, systems. So I started using the term systemics as a stand-in for all these others. And these, this list is just a very few uh, lists of all the different uh, expressions of systems, something that came out of a systems tradition or a system strategy that you're probably all familiar with. Um, so anyway, I combined this notion of systemics with design, which I'd had experience with a lot as a, an architect and, and in my formal training and um, my professional practice. And so it was this notion of designing systems or from a systemic perspective and systemic standing in for all of these uh, other approaches and uh, whatever that could inform uh, the designer about what they were designing, how they were designing, how they were trying to take action, describing, explaining, all of those things. So West, uh, said at uh, some point, systems started uh, when you first looked at the world through somebody else's eyes. And that was a systems approach. And I thought it was really great, very helpful. One is one of those uh, notions that in practice was very helpful. So this is another one that I've used uh, out of many that has been uh, very helpful in uh, systemic design is that you look at the world when you're describing and explaining it, or when it, even when you're designing it, 
is that you look in between what's going on in between other things, elements, systems, people, people and environments, rather than looking at something. So at work, if you were told, well, look at that person and evaluate them, or look at that department and evaluate it, instead of looking at a system, you look in between the system and the other systems that it's related to, or subsystems or meta systems. So when you look in between, um, that's an approach, uh, a systems approach uh, that um, is very concrete and uh, uh, helps tremendously in a world of complexities and uh, distractions. So systems theories, now that we're kind of gone through, there are methods and tools and techniques, but just as an example, looking at systems theories and how they've been evolving uh, in the last few decades. Um, Deborah Hammond wrote a great book that I highly recommend um, on the science of synthesis. And in there, uh, she talks about systems theories uh, post-World War II. And um, she expresses the sort of uh, uncontrolled, nascent theories and the extent controlled. Extent means that they're in existence. Uh, nascent, they're just coming into uh, existence. So uh, the ones that are that we work with all the time, we've probably had at university and, and in professional trainings, and that is that um, there's a, an externally imposed uh, order and control. Uh, it's about determinism. It's about hierarchical decision-making. It's technocracy. It's some of the things that people um, are sort of very uh, negative about nowadays or challenging some of the younger generation. So the nascent or uncontrolled uh, theories is about self-organization, free will, creativity, spontaneity, uh, participatory design making, democracy. And those are still quite nascent and the extent uh, controlled uh, theories are still in charge or the most influential. Um, but uh, they're sort of in, in the wings. And this has been, oh, since 2003 is when she wrote her book. And I would say this is pretty much still um, the uh, situation. She also wrote um, about uh, this uh, over a period of time um, that there have been these milestones in um, uh, systems approaches. So, the dominance of problem solving was one of the first ones, and then uh, the dominance of modeling, and then the dominance of synthesis and uh, integration, and uh, then a kind of an emergent uh, interest in the change of consciousness, which kind of stepped it up a bit uh, in uh, interest and focus. Um, so, Looking at that as kind of a trend, there has been actually, I think, an altering of course. So we've experienced where um, there's been a changing of intentions in theory and method and approach, systems approach. They're redirecting the aims of the inquiry, um, the adjusting the expectations, changing what the uh, outcomes are, and uh, narrowing the bandwidth, uh, reducing diversity and reducing complexity, uh, despite what everybody talks about, uh, acknowledging that the world is more complex than we had imagined, and that diversity is a good thing. We're actually, uh, the systems, approaches, and theories are narrowing the bandwidth, or some of them are narrowing the bandwidth a bit. So the um, in inquiry and communication, both um, 
the extant approach, now the ones that we're living with now, uh, narrowing the bandwidth. So uh, the disciplines and fields are growing. Systems research is becoming more uh, dominant. Uh, design science, all those are narrowing the bandwidth, which is fine. I mean, it's useful for what they're trying to do, but they reduce in communication and, and inquiry, uh, reduce what you're looking at and uh, the diversity and the complexity of what you're looking at. And the incipient, the one that's coming in, we hope, is coming in, is systemic design, which increases uh, bandwidth. And it's sort of like uh, what Wes Churchman, uh, borrowing an idea from uh, Singer, talks about what is sweeping in, about uh, enlarging um, the boundaries of uh, what you're looking at, what you're engaging in inquiry, what you're including. And, and I think for West and Singer, they're coming from the kind of a, a discipline tradition. So they're talking about uh, how you include other disciplines, how you include uh, other fields, and not necessarily uh, how you expand or change how inquiry actually takes place, that it's undisciplined. They're still talking in a way about uh, disciplinary approaches. So the inquiry and control piece is uh, open, the distinction between open systems inquiry and um, closed systems inquiry. So as I said earlier, the, the notion of the sweeping in and enlarging um, what we're looking at, what we're engaging in, and it's more inclusive and diverse and sustainable, adaptive, uh, creative. Those things can only come when you have open systems inquiry, when you have an open inquiry or undisciplined inquiry that's out of control, that we get to have things like uh, inclusiveness and diversity and sustainability. When things are controlled and disciplined, they're exclusionary, reductive, um, constrained, deterministic, and um, you'll run into, I'm sure, that there are boundary keepers, uh, guardians of uh, the closed systems, and they very carefully monitor uh, who's inside and who's outside. It's, it's a very sort of reductive approach. Who has membership in this particular uh, group of people that are doing things? So, and that's fine. I mean, in a lot of cases, we need to have things like quality control and that to ensure that we only have the highest level of uh, uh, scientists working in this particular field on this thing. It has to be very closely monitored and controlled. However, when we're looking for uh, creative, uh, transformative uh, actions, we have to be able to work from an open systems inquiry approach and undisciplined. So make a distinction here from, from non that there's a, a difference between uh, designing as a strategy and uh, as a tactic. So most of the, for instance, the schools of design are all based on tactics. Um, they're not based on uh, looking at the strategy of design. The same is true uh, for systems. Uh, systems has a whole diverse group of tactics they use for engaging in uh, uh, systems inquiry and uh, uh, explaining and describing systems, understanding them. That's different from a more uh, a, a kind of a deeper level of a strategy of systems, uh, thinking about systems, for instance, West's notion of uh, looking at the world through someone else's eyes. So the design inquiry, and this is just a working definition. I'm, I'm careful about the definitions because they tend to cut off uh, inquiry and uh, cut off conversation and, and dialogue. 
anyway, this is a working definition that I use, is that design inquiry is inquiry for action followed by action. And there I have experienced a lot of uh, times where people who describe and, ex and explain the world uh, and very even from a systems perspective in a very uh, high level of excellence, but they don't know how to turn that into action. And in a way, um, I see that as what's going on on a lot of the campuses nowadays where people have clearly defined what an issue is, what they understand clearly what's going on, uh, uh, but they don't know how to turn it into action. They're certain about what's a situation. And what Holmes uh, uh, said was that certainty leaves leads to violence. And so rather than being able to engage in design inquiry to come up with uh, possible solutions for uh, free speech or for the um, the wars that's going on in the Mideast or that sort of thing, if you're not engaging in inquiry for action, you're just working from what you already know and you're certain about, um, that leads to a potential for conflict uh, rather than uh, actually innovation. So the design approaches that we can choose to, uh, amongst is that we can choose um, uh, bounded design, which is problems, um, where we decide amongst uh, potential solutions. Uh, unbounded design, where we're deciding where to draw the boundary around uh, a design, what's inside, what's outside. It's foreground, background, and uh, bounding design. Since I would consider systemic design, it's that you make a judgment about what's inside, what's outside, what's important, what's uh, background, uh, what's ideal, that sort of thing. And then finally, uh, when we're expanding uh, design itself uh, to its sort of bigger, uh, sort of more advanced uh, utility is this notion of advanced design where we're using imagination. And that's not well developed, of course, as an approach yet, but uh, the other three, uh, particularly number one, is very well developed. Uh, uh, number two is um, more developed uh, maybe, and then number three, uh, systemic design is, again, uh, we hope, coming into uh, uh, greater and uh, greater dominance. So the looking in between things, as I just uh, talked about earlier, is uh, uh, looking at systemics and design, and that's as a conjunction, which means that there's an emergence that comes from the conjunction of systems and designing, something larger and more. It's like uh, the notion of wetness coming out of this conjunction of uh, two atoms, two kinds of atoms, that we get water. And uh, wetness is not in either one of those atoms, but it emerges from uh, the conjunction of the two. Same thing with systemics and design. So very quickly, um, before our time uh, uh, runs out, is that I want to give you a few examples of my uh, own undisciplined schemas. Because after I've talked or explained to people, whether in government or academia uh, or uh, business or wherever these some of these ideas that I've just covered in different ways, I'll be asked invariably, uh, where has this been done before? So the assumption that's made, and, and I used to get caught in this trap all the time, is that systemic design is a method. It's something that's applied, and it's not. 
Um, it's a uh, culture of inquiry. It's something we're immersed in. It's not an application. It's not a method. And what is an example? They want a case study. Well, you can say you can do all sorts of case studies for rational thinking, but it doesn't necessarily the case study without some uh, development doesn't give you the principles for why things happened in the way that they did, the deeper principles, which goes back to undisciplined, disciplined, in control, out of control. And um, people are sort of um, caught up. They like things that are steps and phases and recipes or four square matrices, simple schemas uh, uh, to kind of avoid uh, things that have to be uh, complex and uh, uh, aren't easily uh, sort of understood immediately but with uh, just kind of a, a, a very limited amount of engagement. So this is one approach to inquiry, a compound, a schema, where there is um, a disciplined inquiry and undisciplined inquiry. And I've actually used these. These aren't just uh, uh, theories or ideas that I've thought up uh, independent of uh, real world actions. This is stuff I use in the world with people is how to engage in uh, disciplined inquiry and how to engage in undisciplined inquiry. And for instance, back when I was teaching more, I would have uh, the students engage in undisciplined inquiry and to create these ways of seeing the whole through different kinds of perspectives and how you bring them together. And th this has actually been used in uh, very interesting, significant ways in uh, uh, the real world by others. Another one is that, um, and it's very much uh, focused on uh, education, is that there's a lot of argumentation nowadays, you'll probably read it, it comes across it all the time, is whether generalists or specialists are better for organizations, whatever their business or their uh, institutional or their uh, military, which one is the best, generalist or specialist? And it turns out, and I've actually I, uh, had uh, designed and uh, directed graduate programs in whole systems design, the university was very concerned uh, when it was going to be accredited for the first time. Uh, how could we say what the program was? Because it was whole systems. So was it a specialist? We didn't have any specializations in there, mathematicians and, and chemists and, and, and generalists. There was a, a sort of general uh, systems fields or, or something. What, was, what were we going to stand on as what uh, worked? And I told them that the specialists and the generalists sort of formed this field within which systemic designers work, and they work as polymaths. And that means that they pick points in this field and connect them in relationships, links, connections, bonds, into compositions and create design uh, designs from that. And that's what we were about, is educating and uh, uh, helping to support uh, polymath. And polymath is not, I mean, it's not a common sort of focus in uh, academic learning and that, but it doesn't mean uh, genius. It doesn't mean any of those other things that you might be uncomfortable with, but polymath just means that you have this ability to pull diversity together into order. And we need uh, to pay more attention to how we help polymaths uh, develop. And the undisciplined design inquiry, for instance, uh, the way my schema uh, is that I use is we do, we have assessments of what's real. We have research for what's true. We have search for what's ideal. And then we have effect 
uh, reflection in action, <clears throat> what's prudent. And uh, all four of those uh, are necessarily necessary parts of uh, design inquiry uh, for action followed by action. And finally, um, I wanted to give an example of uh, a systemic designing schema I call liquid crystal. That's a combination of disciplined process, a disciplined score, and an undisciplined uh, process, a liquid. Now, this description, this model comes from um, my experiences with working with very successful designers. And I was wondering how did they do things so well under timelines, within budgets, with all these constraints, but still came out with these great uh, creative uh, solutions. And um, this is what I've mapped out. And this actually, again, um, these are stages and phases that I go through myself with my own um, uh, design processes, both crystalline and uh, liquid. So the reality for me is that uh, the systemic design process, the score, is where these things uh, are conjoined and uh, dynamic. And the arrow of time um, is um, a dominant piece. I mean, I see a lot of people drawing models with circles in them, and it's not possible to have processes that repeat themselves in a circular way. There's always an arrow of time. Uh, involved, um, which is important and, and essential in designing. So I will, um, this would be a good place for me to sort of bow out um, with the talk. And I wanted to encourage you, this is something to be, um, I hope, continued, not just a one-shot uh, event and to um, invite you to um, continue to talk with me and with others that are uh, working in a similar vein uh, about what systemic design, undisciplined, out of control, and disciplined and controlled approach to uh, systemic designing can look like, should be like, because we don't know. I mean, it's all still uh, a bit of a mystery, and there's a lot of things we don't know, and we don't have uh, for formal educational programs. We don't have a lot of opportunities uh, for the polymaths to work in. I mean, at one point, there was a lot of interest or talk in business, for instance, and even in military, about uh, T people, people who had breadth and had, who had depth, and we don't hear so much about that anymore. And unfortunately, and this is something I don't know uh, how it's going to work out, but we've totally been overwhelmed with this notion of a new tool and how that tool is going to affect us and how we work and how we work with the tool and whether the, the tool is going to control us or whether we're going to uh, control and use the tool. So AI has become the dominant uh, conversational focus. Um, and I'm not sure how that's going to affect this trend in systemic design becoming more undisciplined and out of control and in partnership with disciplined and controlled inquiry. So that's a, a piece that's um, Thank sort of a real mystery for me. Um, Thank you, Harold. I think, yeah. I think that was wonderful. Thank you so much for the presentation. And as everyone can see here, Harold has listed a couple of the URLs that, um, as he mentioned, this was just the tour guide bus. This was just the tour guide uh, version of it. There's more to explore. There's more to hop into. So uh, we can post them in the chat. You can grab them or you can kind of um, just see see the links available there as well. Um, there is another session on the topic of undisciplined and disciplined. There is the discipline of time at RSD symposiums. And we do have another session starting in about five minutes. I am actually moderating that. So I'm actually going to hop over there ahead of time just to set up. I will not close this session. It can continue if there are folks that want to chat. Um, but 
uh, we do want to encourage uh, everyone once that has come to a natural close, you can come over to the other session that's starting uh, in a few minutes. Thank you again, and I'll I'll leave the room, but I won't close the room. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you, Zan. I appreciate it. And thanks, Harold. Just to briefly um, appreciate that. I once just a very stupid story. I once was hiring people. It was for like a very small job. And as a fun question, we said, what kind of shape would you be and why? And the best candidate, of course, said a ball with a lot of spikes because I've well-rounded, but lots of specialties, lots of. So I thought that was an excellent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did he get the uh, job? They did. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Patrick, hands up. There we go. So, um, not to be too much of a fan, but Carol, I've been waiting for this day for quite a long time. Actually, I wrote you, I wrote you an email some time ago telling you that I had a habit of buying yours and Eric's book uh -huh. to give out to people. So I've probably given out about 20 books. So I'm looking to get a discount right now. It's the only reason I'm here. And I also need the Chinese copy because I'm teaching a course, a design course, co-teaching to medical students. In, in China, and um, ah. I've been recommending the book to them as well. But thank you. I, I wanted to say, oh, of course, no. I mean, thank you for this amazing book. It, it it's been very influential for me, and and it it gave me a departure point to read, to read to read all sorts of others, and also to make sense of the place that I was in. So I just want to share a little bit about that in response to your question about um, where things are going in terms of um, being undisciplined in our so I work in medical education, and that's put me in this really interesting place because um, medical education is going through the same, has these tensions. Medicine is the most professionalized of all professions, probably the most specialized, most disciplined. And um, at, in undergraduate medical programs, at least across Canada, I'm in Edmonton at the University of Alberta, um, there's been a shift to um, recruit um, a wider diversity of companies, um, not only in terms of cultural and racial sense, but, but people who are different kinds of life. So we're now getting rabbis and truck drivers and nurses and artists and designers coming in. And the idea is that they come in with a full degree and ideal experience, but they're bringing their whole selves in as designing, as designer doctors and, and Musician, doctor, and so on. So that's that's a very I'm finding medical education a very interesting place where the same sorts of things are happening. And um, just to go a little bit quickly here, so I I had the great fortune when I first came in here twelve years ago of um, meeting somebody who runs uh, what we call the Arts and Humanities and Health and Medicine, so it's a medical humanities program, um, and that has been an incredible place of learning for me, and it is. Um, By people who are in the field, it's known as a field of play. And they're, and they're very consciously striving to keep it open and permeable, um, uncontrolled. Just, um, it, it's uh, absolutely fascinating. So I'll just, I'll just say that um, I've been reading your writing and everybody. So I, Churchman, I bought every book I could, and I've just, it's just amazing to read that, that, you know, that, those things that seem old but read so well today. Um, but I've also been reading in the medical humanities, so I'll, I'll put a couple things in the chat, but um, Alan Blakely is, is somebody that you might be interested in. Um, and uh, I'll just throw in a couple of other from the social construction scene that have been reading similar things like John Trotter and, uh, and uh, Ken Gurdon. And Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. Hey, if I can, um, Harold, one, one thing that you mentioned right towards the end caught my attention. You said there's always an arrow of time involved when you were looking at things. And there was a, a during, during one of the talks earlier in the week, Peter Stoiko was talking about um, rhythm mapping to understand the cycle of things, you know, just to understand how things go. But then I thought about like one of your first slides 
about stepping into the same river twice. And and the the thought that came to mind and that I wrote down is, you know, even if if the thing you're working on, the system, service, whatever, is cyclical, it's going to be different in every cycle. And that took me back to, you know, you can't use the same system, you can't interact with the same system or service twice because every time you come back to it, it's a different system, a different service because of that arrow of time. So I just wanted to mention that I, I wrote it down, you know, highlighted it. It's something I'm going to have to think about some more. I just wanted to thank you for that closing piece of wisdom. Yeah. One of the things that I got from uh, Horst Riddle is that he gave us an example of the arrow of time if, because everybody wants to do the circle and stuff. He says, and he used to smoke cigars all the time. That's how long ago it was. <laughs> in class. So anyway, he took out one of his little uh, matches and he lit it. He says, unlight it. <laughs> no, it's, it's transformed. It's something else. And in design, when you're engaged, you create new kinds of information that's totally different from the kind of information you were engaged in before, because you go through this transformational arrow and uh yeah it's it's amazing we they forget about arrow of time a lot i mean i had physics classes and everything where friction you know where things wore out and wore down and that's in architecture nobody thought about when this building would start to fall apart and fall down in it because the arrow of time things wear out things change um transform people People can transform, be totally different, not just in a kind of a, a linear way or even a semi-linear way, but they transform. They're, it's something different. And uh, design is like that. When you're taking in information, when you have an aha moment, and then when you're trying to innovate, that's all different kind of work, totally different kinds of work. So that's a that's an important point. I'm glad you picked it up. Yeah, thank you. I just want to say it was very nice to see you again, Harold. And uh, hi there. <laughs> and, uh, hi there, Berger. Hi, hi. <laughs> nice to see you and uh, um, see you. This, this is obviously a, a new lecture, slightly different, but you have talked about these things for a while, so it's uh, it's really nice to see it again and. Uh, this error of time reminds me of a moment in Oslo when we were <coughs> looking at um, some cybernetists uh, lecture with uh, talking about circularity and we were sort of mentioning where is the error of time or where is the, it, it's never repeating in the same way anyway. So. I wouldn't say it's not uh, useful to have those circular models, but uh, they have to be um, handled with care, I think. And yeah. Not forget uh, how things change. Yeah, yeah. I use the example of cooking a lot. So if you say, you know, you take all these elements, you go to the market, you gather all these elements, you bring them home, you start to prepare, you proportion them, you do all these things, and then you transform them through heat and through other things and all the way through until you have a communal uh, feeding, a dinner. Those are all dramatically different from one another. And you can't sort of uncook a apple pie and get back to the pile of apples <laughs> you can't do that you can't reverse the arrow of time and you manage carefully how you go from the ingredients to the mixes to the proportions to temperatures and heat and all the rest of it and um, that's a design a systemic design process is that same uh, thing and uh, so anyway yeah that's it's uh gets lost a lot, especially in nowadays, I see a lot of these models for designing that people have, and if they're very simplistic, which is, uh, I mean, can be okay in one way, 
as long as they're not taken totally out of context of what's the real complex process that's involved. Yeah. Hey, Harold, I just have a simple question. I don't want to, Cheryl, hi. Oh, hi, Cheryl. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just have a simple question, just to clarify, clarifying question for me. And that is um, your last slide. I haven't seen that image before that I can think of in uh, your work. Um, and it, it's the one that is, has a mixed process, you know, and you have quite a few things. You didn't say whether that's sequential. So like, can that be, can you go back and forth on that scale? Or is it, do you see it as a progressive scale? It's an arrow of time. It is the you arrow of time. And okay. you can't, un and you can't unlight the match. Like when you go through and you transform what you've done and thought about, and you go to the next level of whatever you're doing, you can't unlight it. And in the real world, when you're doing projects with budgets, with schedules and everything, you have to pass these uh, points, these milestones and move on to the next one in order for the thing to appear in the world. You can't, uh, so yeah. Okay, I hadn't put it together. I didn't put the image together with the concept of the arrow. So that's great. That that clarifies it. Thank you. Thank you for everything that you did. <laughs> well, it's well, Birger uh, started it because he mentioned the concept of undisciplined. So I started chasing him around this concept. So it's it's wonderful that we've come all the way around to having this conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. this is fun for me. Yeah. <laughs> I see a, a a familiar face here. I think. Yeah. It's me. Look at you. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Gray hair, man. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to see you. Yes. And, uh, Where are you? Have good memories. I spoke about you today. We have a workshop here in Oslo. Uh -huh. And uh, you are there. All right. <laughs> and I pursued everything that I learned with you with good care and uh, have good stories to tell you. All right. I'll be glad to okay. hear it. Yeah. Stay uh, in touch. For yeah. Stay in touch, Flo. Yeah. yeah. So are you. You in, are you in Oslo permanently now or just visiting? Yes, yes I am. OK. Yes. OK. And um, yeah, just taking the opportunity to share and learn a lot. OK. It gets cold in Oslo. If they haven't told you, it gets cold in Oslo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just heads okay. up. <laughs> See you. Thank you. Harold, it's Peter. Oh, hi, Peter. All right. Um, I have a question that might be kind of a provocation around the different forms of uh, binding and bounding. So with a given project, you know, have you found, I mean, because I think I have, that we can start with a bounded project because that's what the sponsor or the client has in mind. You know, and some of us have had practices that range across, uh, you know, that are known for different things. Like not everything I do is systemic design or was. But the going from a, a well-framed, bounded kind of design that has a certain outcome in mind to the bind to the um, binding judgment process of determining kind of what system, what what where and what what stakeholders, what participants are going to be involved, and then expanding that perhaps even beyond the judgment. But I think that there are, there are a number of times in which I've I have moved between those different. Um, boundary shifts that you've described rather than treating them as different practices. They may be different um, stages of engagement that we might have um, in, in a different pro in a type of project, especially if you have kind of a mixed practice like I have where I had traditional clients with you know very prescribed things to do. And then sometimes they would get into trouble and they would call me into like save, you know, I, I got called into like save projects because I knew the project management and also to creatively reposition something. And that takes, you know, reframing or, or 
kind of unbinding and rebinding, so some judgment, but yet the final product might come back into something that's well-defined, well-bounded. Well so this, in, in my mind, looking, I, I think there's a lot more that could be said just around the, you know, those concepts. It's, it reminds me of like, like what Dick Buchanan was getting to with the four orders of design, which were not four different things we could design or at different scales. There were ways that designers could shift the focus to create from you know, one intent to a larger and expansive intent while keeping all those skills in line and bringing all the design skills that they have into being. So could you say more about you know, like shifting between those, you know, those um, dimensions, if you will? Yeah, um, at least the way that I've experienced an approach, it's not like shifting between them. It's like taking different choice, making different choices about how you approach. So if you do a bounded, you know, and I've done bounded, and um, somebody's already decided that here's the different ways, the, the possible uh, solutions, and you have to define which or decide or help them, which is the most effective, efficient, what's the cost one, which is the best one. Then if you don't want to collude with them because of the way they have framed what they're doing or what their outcomes are, uh, their potential, you can just say, no, I'll, it, it's like, I used to like Russ. <laughs> I never got away with this a lot, but Russ Akoff would tell uh, somebody, a company when they came and said, here's our problem. And we want you to work on this. And he would say, you hire me for six months and I'll come back and I'll tell you what your problem is or what it, it's not. So, and that's a, a, a very entirely different approach. And uh, like West, you know, his schema that I use a lot is asking questions, well-formed questions so that People come in with a kind of a certitude about what they think is going on, what's real, and what's true, and all this stuff. And he would say, in a design process, he said, who's the client? Who should the client be? So it brought ethics in. These others don't have ethical dimensions. Um, what's the measure of performance? All those things. And you get people to ask the questions and start to answer. That's an entirely different process. So it's very different from choosing amongst predetermined solutions to saying what's from the very get-go, um, ethically and everything else, politically, who ought to be served and who ought to be the designers and who ought to be involved and who ought to be the decision makers. It gets uncomfortable with some clients doing that because it turns up a lot of rocks, but um, anyway, it, it's an approach. So I would say, for me, it's like you decide, you have the freedom to decide as the designer which one you're going to try to take and promote. And and um, because one of your clients, for me, uh, it always is um, future generations. So when this client comes in and says this, and then their surrogate clients will come in and say, well, if you serve me, everybody else will be served okay, you, you just take care of me, uh, which a doctor will do in a medical setting. And, you know, if you take care of me, all the nurses, patients, everybody will be taken care of instead of you look at the patients first or whatever. Uh, so anyway, I would say it's how you begin to choose amongst all of those and nothing is given. So it's up to you um, and your own sort of... Uh, uh, interests. Are you uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. engineering it? Are you worried about uh, effects of you know, ethics and things like that? Or are you worried about environmental impacts or, you know, those kind of things? So you partner up in the contract that you form mm -hmm. with them. There's an exchange. And uh, as an architect, they forced us into including others because we had codes and we had all these things. So the client could come in and say, I don't want you to put in any fire doors. And I could, hmm. in a cowardly way, I could always say, no, there's codes for that. You can't do that. I have to put in fire doors. But um, 
there's other things like environmental and social and cultural things you can challenge and push back on say, so, you know, I think it's really better that, you know, so it's the relationships always tense because you have those kind of differentiations, but uh, yeah, I would just say short mm -hmm. answer. Mm -hmm. You make those decisions between approaches and it's, it's you can make uh, and along with who your clients are, people you're working with, can say, yeah, that's a better approach, I think. You know, that makes me feel I'm going to get what I want, what we need more than this other way. So. Those are, yeah, that, that's a good point about making, you know, really giving some thought to the choice before you get into it. Because, I mean, while you can change a project when it's underway, and I've done that many times, really what you write in the proposal is something that you're expected to keep your word yeah. for. And the proposal is, you know, is part of the strategy and you can't, the arrow of time is on, is not with you, you know, is going against you on, on that proposal. Like re if you build in the process to rethink things as you or to build in this buffer to, you know, to do some exploration or that six months, of, of co-learning and then developing something, you know, you could, that could actually be in the proposal that could be at risk that could educate the client. They could, yeah. Probably most of the time they'll say that isn't what we want, but you might not want that client either. So, yeah, hmm. I've had to fire clients. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Boy, very good. All right. Good to see you. Looks like you for your you're not in Oslo. Oh, I am, but my picture is from oh, okay. uh, Monterrey. Yeah, so, <laughs> okay. where I'm, I'm in Mexico City now, but for where, right. where I, but this, yeah, I'm in Oslo. Okay, yeah. okay. It gets cold there. Uh, it's not so bad this week. Okay. <laughs> so who uh, was there, somebody up? Oh yeah, I just wanted to make a quick, sort of, yeah, sorry, I don't want to talk too much. <laughs> uh, Peter, I was also, I was sort of, I wanted to respond to both your question and, and Harold's answer um, by saying something that 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 has been interesting to me working as a staff designer at an academic institution is um, I think it's given me um, a little bit more flexibility to negotiate the scope of projects. Um, so just also think about working like and I imagine this probably the case for you as an academic there's something uh, really wonderful also challenging about having client colleagues. So um, we find in our projects, it's it, things tend to be more fluid as they are at universities. We do we do, do cost recovery, so we are charging. But we're able to very easily say, our step is always discovery. We start with a discovery phase. Um, and we say, we're going to, we're going to do that first um, and come back to you and then, then we'll work together. And that seems to be working well. So I don't mean that as advice that I need to give you, because I'm sure you know, but I'm, what I'm trying to highlight is the different contexts in which these designers might work. And I, I feel really um, privileged to be working in public service at a academic institution where there's that freedom to work with you. Mm. Good. So is that it? Are we done? Are we finished? So don't be strangers, okay? Um, serious about staying in touch and this whole process of trying to develop uh, a new school for systemic designers that I call the Design Flight School. And there's a reason it's called a flight school uh, because of the kind of pedagogies that traditional flight schools have, I think, are great. People tell me, I don't want a lot of theory and thing. I want to, I want to do something. I want to take action. And I say, guess what? You have a weekend workshop on flying a jet. Nobody's going to give you the key to the jet. <laughs> but you need to know how to take action. You know how to do it. It's a long time uh, involved process.